All right, so today we're continuing in our Advent series called God With Us, and we're doing something a little bit different uh, than, I suppose, a standard, what I personally feel like is a standard Advent series. Usually you talk about uh, directly the events that took place when Jesus arrived the first time around, and we we remember and we reflect on and we, re- we read these familiar passages, whether they're prophecies in the Old Testament or they're of the Christmas story itself, most often found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 because that's the holiest of, of all chapters <laughs> in how to talk about uh, the arrival of Jesus uh, because of Charlie Brown, of course. And so... <laughs> Uh, which is still my favorite Christmas special, by the way. Uh, But what makes this particular year so different and so unique is that we're going to be looking at the idea of covenant or these promises that God makes with either just humanity in general and or just specific people at specific times and how those covenants throughout the Old Testament really direct our attention to this coming Savior who we believe is Jesus Christ. And so today we light the peace candle. For some of you traditionalists out there, it may not be the peace candle. It might be something else. But today we're talking about peace. So I digress. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, Thank you. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of review because that's always helpful for me to keep me on the right track and also to help you catch up to where we were last week. So last week we learned that there are nine major covenants that God made in the Bible. And those are the Edenic, Adamic, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Palestinian, Davidic, the new covenant with Jesus, and then Uh, overarching and in and through all is the eternal covenant that God has. Now, full disclosure, spoiler alert, we're not going to be going through all of them. (sighs) I know. Uh, There's just not enough weeks in Advent, and so there you have it. So, but today uh, we're going to be covering the Abrahamic covenant, and that's going to be exciting. Now, you might be wondering, okay, according to the Bible, what constitutes a covenant? What makes it up? What is, is there a formula to it? Is there a way that it's supposed to be? Actually, there is. And so there's three particular parts that are part of every covenant in the Bible. Uh, The first is that there's some kind of words or promises given. Uh, There's, uh, so that would be like uh, in a marriage ceremony when you have, there's like one particular portion that every Uh, ordained person who does a marriage has to say or else it's not legally binding so I've heard Um, and so like it's kind of the do you do you okay good kind of in that uh, in that vein but there's words there's things that help define the the covenant the second factor in the Bible is blood that there's usually some kind of sacrifice involved with a covenant. And we see that as early as the Adamic covenant, which we learned about last week. There's also a seal or a token of a covenant, and that is, uh, there's some kind of an evidence or some kind of reminder that helps you know that a promise took place, and it helps the people who are attached to that promise keep that promise. So think, you know, our, our most amazing, perfect overused illustration of covenant these days is the the covenant of marriage and so think about a wedding ring um, or wedding tattoo is pretty in vogue these days but you do some kind of thing you you have some kind of a token that helps you remember oh yeah almost 13 years ago i married 14 see i missed a year (laughs) but see but i know that there's a covenant that took place some time ago. And so, and it helps me remember that. <laughs> I'm just digging myself. <laughs> digging. Here we go. 
I digress. So, but their point is there's a seal, there's a token, right? You get it. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> now I get to toss the shovel away. Here we go. All right, so last week we learned about the Edenic and Adamic covenants found in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Our big idea that we learned last week is that Jesus has always been the long-awaited hope for creation, um, and that is evident in how uh, we see in Eden, everything was perfect as it was supposed to be. Obviously, today, that is not the experience that you and I probably have. Um, even on our best days, something is, ki is broken, something is kind of just not right with the world at large. Even if our part might be sunshine and rainbows on a particular day, maybe other days it's not. And we, and even that's just a, a trivial way of thinking of it, but we are reminded that there was a way it was supposed to be. And that even though there was a point when things went wrong and things went awry, God knew that this was going to take place and he had a plan for how to remedy our issue of sin and to uh, bring redemption uh, to fallen creation. Okay, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So to, the title for today's message is The Promise of Peace. And our main passage is going to be Genesis 15. And our big idea is that Jesus fulfills the promise of of peace. Jesus fulfills the promise of peace. Now, uh, to kind of set up our topic for today, we're going to do a little bit of, uh, we're going to use sort of that matrix that we learned last week with the, the words, the blood, and the, the covenant, sorry, the seal, uh, and we're going to apply that to the Abrahamic covenant. So I know it's kind of getting the cart before the horse, I don't normally like to do that, but it's going to help our time. Here we go. You can go to the next slide. So, yeah, next slide. Thank you. Okay, so the Abrahamic covenant. Woo! Okay, so there comes this point in the book of Genesis, the book of Origins, where uh, we transition from God dealing with all of humanity, uh, Genesis 1 through 11, and then suddenly there's a shift that takes place, and God focuses and zeroes in on one man of one family that is going to be the, the instrument and to bless the world. And so in Genesis chapter 12, we learn, uh, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And some of that, that blessing language should sound familiar because that's also a direct tie and quote to the original thing of how for humanity we were supposed to be a blessing to uh, to the world and multiply and bless and all that. So, the words of the covenant. There are certain promises that God made. He gave a personal blessing in verse 2. He meant for that blessing to be something that we were a conduit of, that we would be a blessing to others, um, that we would also be blessed by others because of this favor, this blessing that uh, is tied to this covenant with Abraham. There's also a messianic blessing, or uh, that's an Old Testament fancy word for the Savior who was to come. And uh, in verse 3, um, where all the families on earth will be blessed, it's not, it, even though it starts with Abraham and his future family, it's going to expand to all families of the earth. And there's some, uh, some good for you and I who uh, are, are grafted in. Um, and then also a blessing of a great name in verse 2. You can go to the next slide. So there's also some more promises of the covenant. And so 
uh, let's see, uh, there's a blessing of the offspring that uh, Abraham, even though he's 75 years old at this point, um, <laughs> believe it or not, he doesn't have any kids. Uh, but God says that he will have kids and that he, they will be blessed as his offspring. Uh, in verse 1, yeah, uh, it's, it's, sorry, uh, there's this funky little thing on the back wall of me trying to flip there. Anyway, I digress. So there's a blessing of the land itself. So God says that there's this country that I'm going to take you to, and I'm going to lead you there. I just need you to go <laughs> from your country and follow my leading. And then finally, uh, this, this promise of the covenant, um, there's a blessing a victory that's found in another snapshot moment in Abraham's life, uh, where in Genesis twenty two seventeen, 17, um, following uh, a situation where he was going to offer up his son Isaac to, as a sacrifice, um, God says, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And so that, that phrase, offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, that's a warlike term, that's a victory kind of term, that they're going to take, take the wall, they're going to take, take the ground, right? That kind of thing. You can go to the next slide. Okay, there's more words of the covenant. Yeah, yep, okay, yep, this is why, because we're in a different chapter now. Another snapshot of Abraham's life. It's funny, in Genesis, you go from, like, kind of overarching kind of thing, chapters 1 through 11, then, then we slow way down, and we see all these different vignettes from Abraham's life. So, like this one, uh, so where God is, again, talking to Abraham, he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you, and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so, again, here are some promises. There's a blessing that kings are going to come or, you know, rulers are going to, you know, be part of the offspring in verse 6 there, uh, that kings shall come from you. Uh, there's also this promise of a divine relationship that's set up through God's covenant dealings with Abraham. You can go to the next slide. So that's, those are words. Also, with every covenant, there's, uh, there's, there's the positive, there's the positive words, promises, that kind of thing. Then there's the curse if it doesn't take place. Now, what's unique about the Abrahamic covenant is that the only curse attached to all the different promises God made to Abraham, all kind of wrapped up into one, is this promise that God would curse those who curse Abraham. That's a pretty sweet deal. <laughs> if, if God's going to make you a promise that it's like, hey, if anybody disrespects you, guess what? <laughs> it's coming. And so, uh, but that, you know, those are some words that are attached there. Next slide. Uh, go ahead. Next. Ah, thank you. Okay. Final bit with the words. I know how excited you guys are. And I believe there's going to be a payoff for this in the end. Here we go. Okay, now, just like everything uh, attached with an agreement or a compact between two parties, there's terms of a covenant. Uh, they were, uh, for Abraham, uh, he was called, similar to Adam and Eve, to faith and obedience. And we see that uh, in Genesis 15, where, which will be in just a moment, spoilers, uh, that God believed him, and he count, or sorry, ha, huh, and Abraham believed what God said, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And then in Genesis 22, 18, it says, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed 
my voice. So there's both that faith piece and that obedience piece. Okay, in uh, Genesis 22:16, there's an oath that that's taken place where God says, uh, at the beginning of that passage, He says, "By myself I have sworn," declares the Lord, "because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven uh, and the sand on the seashore." And so, by God swearing by Himself. He is making this irrevocable because God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. Uh, he's also a covenant-enabling God and a revealing God uh, where he wants to make covenant with people. But the thing is, the, the key foundational characteristic of God that we see weaved throughout the Bible is God is faithful. He follows through. You can take it to the bank. If he makes a promise with you, he's going to keep it. So, he makes this promise to Abraham, and we see this written, not at the time, but later on in the books of Genesis and Exodus in the Bible. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Now, to the blood. Here we go. So, there's a sacrifice uh, of the covenant. So, uh, we see this show up in Genesis 14, where uh, we see kind of this precursor of communion, which we'll take in a few moments. Uh, with bread and wine symbolizing uh, the sacrifice of a covenant. There's an actual animal sacrifice that we're going to learn about in just a moment in Genesis 15. And there's this sacrifice of Isaac or human sacrifice that is requested, required from God, where he says, hey, you know, you've been trusting me this far along the way. I need you to offer up your one and only son. And of course, this is a, a foreshadowing moment to what Jesus would do. Um, and even in that moment, God stops Abraham right before he's about to follow through on this. And he says, stop. Now I know you're not going to withhold anything from me. And God provides a substitute with the ram, which is all a foreshadow of Jesus. Okay, so now, also within this, this blood portion, there's usually a mediator, somebody who does the covenanting thing, you know, uh, like going down to the courthouse and somebody's mediating that. So there is, in the Old Testament, and in Old Testament times, you would go and a priest would be the mediator between you and God, or you and some party and whatnot. So first we see in Genesis 14, the priesthood of Melchizedek, that there. Uh, there was somebody who named Melchizedek, king of Salem, who helped broker uh, that and encourage and assure Abraham of God's favor in his life. And we see in Abraham's own life, his own priesthood as the priest of his family, where uh, he's established that in Genesis 15, and then he intercedes on behalf of his nephew Lot and their family in 18 through 19. Finally, uh, in this portion, there's the sanctuary of the covenant where this all takes place. And uh, for the Abrahamic covenant, uh, it's passed down from Abraham, who was the father of Isaac, who was the father of Jacob. And each one of those built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord, which in Hebrew, to our best attempts at understanding what that name would be, is Yahweh. And so they would call on the name of the Lord there at that place of sacrifice, and that was the place where the covenant would be, would take place. Next slide. Seal of the covenant. We're not going to go a deep dive into this because it's a whole hairy topic. However, it's just important to know the seal of the Abrahamic covenant uh, was the rite of circumcision. If you don't know what circumcision is by now, look it up some other time. Uh, or ask me later. I'm not going to go there. Other than to say, it, it just, it's something that happens and uh, that God uh, asked Abraham to do as a sign for this covenant. Now, the significance of it is that it was this outward thing that would happen to the body, and it would be an outward sign of an inner commitment to the terms of the covenant. This should sound sort of familiar. Now, the importance of it is that circumcision of the guys of the family 
It was necessary in order to be recognized as part of the covenant people. This was so important that Moses, who failed to do this for his sons, God almost killed him because he didn't do this. Big deal uh, back then. So there you have it. Now, uh, ask me later about that too. Now, the fulfillment of all of this in this rite of circumcision is found in Christ. We see this fulfilled in, through uh, his experience as an infant, as, uh, as someone born into a Jewish family, he was circumcised. And uh, through the baptism at the Jordan, again, outward sign of an inner commitment to the Lord. Now, he modeled that to us as believers, as Christians, that today, you and I, thank God, uh, we're not bound to the rite of circumcision physically, but spiritually, there's a lot going on. We are we're called to obedience through water baptism, um, and then also the circumcision of the heart, where there's where we're marked on the inside by our relationship with Him in this new covenant. Sound good? All right. I don't even know what I just said. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that hit the replay. Uh, so, um, where the circumcision of the heart is something that God does on the inside of us that marks us on the inside, not the outside, even though there will be evidence in our life from that kind of experience. Cool. All right. So, that's all the, the official academic stuff, because I think it's really important um, just in case you, you happen to think that I'm so great for knowing all this stuff, I, I, I virtually, uh, there's this book called The Covenants, uh, which is written by um, uh, professors from a Bible college I went to, and they're super brilliant, and instead of reinventing the wheel, full disclosure, I just, I, I was a typist, and I typed it in and just looked at it and said, oh, good, there's a bullet point, here we go. Um, but as you can see from all my ramblings, you're getting the undistilled stuff right here. Uh, so, just as a reminder, <laughs> through all of that, that head knowledge stuff about covenant, because it's really important to draw all these connections throughout uh, Abraham's life and throughout Scripture, we are talking today of how Jesus fulfills the promise of peace and how important that is in our lives today, especially in this season where I'm sure, boy, uh, this, this weekend alone, there have been so many activities and things I've seen on the socials online uh, that uh, there's a lot of people bemoaning the fact that there's so much going on and crammed into these few days and I went to this one particular event yesterday, and uh, I was that guy at one point where it's like the, the look on the face uh, where it's just like, oh, do I have to be here? <laughs> uh, this does not feel very peaceful to me in my soul right now as an introvert. This is not good. And yet, this, this Advent season that we are rehearsing and remembering how Jesus came the first time around, is that Jesus ultimately is that fulfillment of peace for you and I. And so we remember that as we look at Abraham's life. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis 15, beginning in verse 1. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, but whichever version you have is fine. All right. After these things, after the thing with Melchizedek, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Ab Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless in the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, 
Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Adam drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, Abram, excuse me, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for four hundred years but i will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with the with great possessions as for you you shall go to your fathers in peace amen you shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the amorites is not yet complete when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Friends, this is the word of the Lord recorded in Genesis. And the first thing I see in this Abrahamic covenant and this promise of peace is that there is a yearning of peace. A yearning of peace. So here we have Abram, which... His name means high father or great father. Um, and he's gone throughout life pretty well. He's had a lot of favor in his life up until that point. He even has a wife. He has his nephew with him. He has all these possessions, all these, these servants. Angie and I were, uh, we were reading the Bible sometime this week, and Angie was pointing out, isn't it amazing how he had like 300 men, just men in his camp. That's a, it's like Abraham was like the governor of a traveling city. Um, it, amazing. But there's still something missing in his life. And it was that he didn't have any children to share it with. He had his family with Sarai, his wife, but he didn't have any children to pass on this legacy of faith to this this family heritage that he had. And so there was this yearning of peace. There was also uh, the fact that, you know, he was 75 years old in Genesis chapter 12 when God called to him. I'm only, what, 36? Is that how old I am? I don't even know. But I'm, so I'm 36. Shoot. I can't even imagine waiting till I'm 75 to just receive that call and then he had to wait, you know, 24 years or so until he saw the fulfillment of, of having this child. Amazing. Amazing that for Abram, he so believed God in that place of, of yearning, in that place of, of incompleteness, that he was willing to step out in faith and to go where God called him to go. But for someone who was expecting all his life from the time when his parents first named him in that kind of a, a speaking a hope and a future over their child kind of action, 
describing that characteristic, for somebody who expected to be a father, to not be a father, there was emptiness there. There was, there, um, there was an ache of an unmet expect expectation and reality for him. And there was devastation. How many of you have been in a place of devastation just this year? Or just this last season? We'll talk just generally speaking, I guess. I know I have. And that there are times in our lives where there is just this ache inside of us where things are not as they're supposed to be, not even as we had expected them, and yet there is hope. There is a peace that God promises. That, And it's, it's funny, uh, for so many of us, uh, sometimes we think, maybe I'm alone in this, but where, man, if I just won the lottery, things would be better. <laughs> then I could fix things. Then things, I would feel full in my life. But how many of you know, boy, there's so many stories of people who win the lottery and then it just wrecks their life. And yet for Abraham, he's in this moment where, I mean, God is just pouring out favor on this guy. Favor after favor, favor after favor. But he's like, God, what good is all this stuff if I don't have a, a kid to pass it off to? And so then we, we enter into the conversation from there. So this makes me wonder for you and for me, what are the deeper longings of your soul that might feel unmet in this moment? And how could God's peace bring resolution to you. If Jesus fulfills the promise of peace, how could that be something that God might want to do in and through you this Advent season? The next thing I see in our passage is the promise of peace. The promise of peace. And so here we have God responding to Abram. And in verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him, and then God very quickly points out, I know that you think it's going to go this way, that, you, that this Eliezer guy, he's going to be your heir, but that's not how it's going to go down. That's not going to be your story, Abram. And so God says, hey, come outside. Let me show you something. And so he points him to the sky, and he says, look up at the sky. If you can number the stars, this is a little bit of a hyperbole, if you can number those stars, your offspring can be numbered. And the point really is that nobody, unless you're really that way, nobody really wants to sit and number the stars. <laughs> there are some people, I suppose, who do. Uh, but Abram, I'm sure he was satisfied. He had enough on his, his plate, and it's like, okay, all right. I see this claim. I hear your claim that this is going to be my offspring, that it'll be that many, many folks that come from me. We also see in verse 7 uh, this description of who God is and a reminder of who God is. This is fascinating uh, as someone who spent a lot of time in Genesis before because he says this, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Pause. When God first called Abram, in Genesis 12, he was not in Ur. He was in Ur in chapter 11, when his family was in Ur. He hadn't even been called by God yet, and God still had a plan for him. What this tells me is that he, he uses, I am the Lord, all capital letters. That is our English way of signaling us to know that this is the name of Yahweh. This is his covenant name. This is the name that God likes to be known by. That he is Yahweh who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans before you even knew me, Abram. I brought you out from there. I am sovereign, and I brought you out there. That's what the Lord would say to him. And so then... Uh, where am I at? Ha, ah, here we go. 
uh, to give you this land to possess. This is the land that God had been leading him to. That country, that nation that he was going to lead him to that we learned about in chapter 12. And so then in verse 8, we, we see this need for assurance where, um, where Abram, he says, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? At this point, I mean, it should be enough that the word of the Lord comes to you and is pointing all these things out to you and all of that. That's, that should be miracle enough. But he's like, I need a guarantee. He's somewhere between the 75-year-old age and the 90-plus-year-old age in that kind of window. And he needs some assurance of this promise of peace. And so in, in this portion that's leading up to the, the moment of the covenant, we see this building anticipation for the fulfillment where Abram is, he, he's known as great father, but he doesn't have any kids. He's, he's getting all this favor. His, his wealth is growing. His, his company is growing, all of that. And um, for him... The fulfillment the, of that expectation is that he would actually have a baby to call his own, that Sarai somehow miraculously would give birth to a baby, um, even though that was a bit of a brain buster, and it still is for me today. <laughs> uh, now, this makes me wonder for you and for me, what is the promise of peace in your life? What are you waiting for? I, I can't answer that for you. I know, interestingly enough, um, that, man, for me, one of the promises of peace for my life was just coming here uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there was a lot of unrest in my soul in the time that led up to us arriving here in Florence. Um, it could be a whole number of things. Um, you know your life better than I do, and so I'll leave it there. But what is the promise of peace in your life? Now, on a very practical level, for you and I as believers, our promise of peace starts with Jesus. And it starts with the fact that Jesus has a family for you and I to be a part of, to belong to, because of this connection with Abraham. The second thing is that we now have access to a relationship with God through faith because of Abraham, because of Jesus tied to Abraham, because we are grafted into this covenant by faith. That for you and I, a promise of peace for our life, maybe even just the most primary base foundational level promise of peace for you and me is that relationship. And if that weren't enough, we also have the promise of actual peace for our lives. What that means is that in, a, in the biblical word for peace is shalom, which is Hebrew, which uh, on the surface of things means peace, but it's not just a, an absence of conflict, uh, like I would love it to be in my house when the boys get all crazy and, and, and my daughter sometimes gets really frustrated and Angie and I are pulling our hair out and all of that, and, but they're a blessing. And so, um, but it's not that. It's God's wholeness and God's completeness for that person, that place, or that thing. And so to, to greet somebody with the greeting of shalom or to, is to wish God's best and God's good for them and that they would be experience that completeness in his presence. And I would submit to you today that in Jesus is how you and I experience that peace because Jesus fulfills the promise of peace. Finally, uh, bringing it home. In our passage, we see the scandal of peace. And uh, I'm not going to go into a, a ton of detail, per se, about specific things other than 
to say, God requires a sacrifice for this covenant to be ratified. And so he, he asks for a heifer, a female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, which for us that sounds like a wild prescription for a covenant, but somehow Abraham just had that because he had a lot of cattle and everything in between, right? Uh, but so he has, he has this provision, he has this, uh, these elements available for the sacrifice. And where we get the biblical understanding of what's called cutting the covenant is that this was actually a practice that was done with covenant where you would uh, take this animal, you'd cut it into, you'd put the two halves kind of opposite each other. And the practice person to person was that uh, each person making the covenant would walk through these these halves of this this animal. And the idea behind it is kind of like cross your heart and hope to die, stick a needle in your eye kind of thing. Basically, if I break this covenant, let me be like these animals that are cut into and devastated. Now, something interesting about, about this portion, there's two things. One is that God first, when Abraham, he, he prepares the covenant, he fights off all these these vultures and everything, and uh, God's word comes to him, and he says that basically your offspring are going to be slaves for about 400 years, but there's going to be deliverance, and they're going to eventually possess this land in the fourth generation. But not only that, what's fascinating is that then the only person who walks through the covenant is... God. Did you catch that? Here we go. So we see the smoking fire pot and the flame passing between these two things, and that is a, a symbol, and that's a, uh, a picture of God walking through these, these halved animals. Abram didn't walk through, even though it's a covenant for him. This is like even more of a reiteration that this is something that is irrevocable because God doesn't break his promises. His promise to Abram stands. And you and I, by faith in Jesus, we are beneficiaries of that, that promise to Abraham. And so this brings us to the cross, how uh, Jesus, our God with us, our Savior, Messiah, he makes good on bringing us his total peace into reality. He doesn't expect us to be the ones to make the effort. He's the one who does all the work. All he does is he offers that to you and to me by faith to say, will you accept this grace that I have for you? We see at the cross that Jesus is both the mediator, that, that, that priest who, who facilitates this covenant taking place, as well as the sacrifice, laying down his life in our place, like that substitute for Isaac. And so, for you and for me, our brokenness and our yearnings, ultimately, at a foundational core level, they find their fulfillment in Jesus at the cross. That's a scandalous thing. Even at this point in the, the narrative of the Bible, that's an amazing thing for you and for me. Will you trust him today? Let's pray.